Hello, all you skibbes. This is Great Answer. Once again, this is the third try at this particular intro. Uh, people think I don't edit. Ha <laughs> ha I edit more than you ever will know. And uh, I am really glad to be back from my long trip. Um, I was traveling all over down the East Coast, mainly up, um, trying to visit people and do three different brews. We did South Carolina, we did Rochester, New York, and we did Pittsburgh, which was the 69th brew ever. And it was awesome. And that's where I actually got the interview you're about to listen to. But, of course, before I talk about the interview, I have to talk about my wonderful sponsors, like Japanese Bound. Now, Japanese Bound is where you can find various videos from Japan uh, made by the people that we tend to like to learn from, uh, including some that are coming over to do uh, classes or have done intensives. You've heard interviews here um, when I was the Ropecast with people like Daka Akira and... Um, uh, that is one of the artists that is available there. You can also find some of them that not only are not available anywhere else, but they're only available for a short time, which is why I'm telling you about this right now. The Kawakami Yu, um, which is a series of videos, sort of the equivalent of the training of O from uh, the kink.com, only a Japanese version. And you can think about all that that entails. Well, that's uh, going to be going away pretty soon. So if you want to try out one of those kinds of videos, you might want to visit Japanese Bound and at least dot, or JapaneseBound.com and at least tell them thanks for supporting the Great Answer podcast. And also, of course, our dear friends at TwistedMonk.com. Now, I usually talk about his rope or about his monk sack. Oh, my God, his wonderfully stuffed monk sack. But in this case, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, a little more mundane. I'm going to tell you that if you're ever tying next to me and you decide you want to use my bondage shears, you best be left-handed, my friend, because they are left-handed shears that I got from Twisted Monk. And that makes all the difference. Uh, it is the fact that he actually takes the time to sell left-handed shears uh, is part of why I love and admire the man so much. Well, that and the fact that he sponsors our podcast. But please feel free to visit TwistedMonk.com. I can't tell you to get the color of the month because it's already sold out. It always sells out very, very quickly. So um, I will tell you, you can find on the website GreatAnswer.Libsyn.com, which is the fancy, fancy, fancy redesign for the podcast website you can find a link to his site and uh, if you go and get your rope from him through that then you'll be supporting the podcast even more and speaking of supporting the podcast patreon my patrons um, that go to patreon.com forward slash great answer also help pay the bills for this podcast things like software upgrades and equipment upgrades and the time to run this thing through a leveler twice even uh, or re-record things. So I really uh, want to say thank you to all of you. And please, now normally right about now I'd start pitching uh, Rope Craft or some of the other events that Naya and I are doing um, or upcoming grooves. And I'm going to do that. I want you to actually tune in at the end of the uh, podcast because there's something pretty cool that we're doing with the day passes for Rope Craft. We already were cutting, cutting edge because we didn't say if you buy a Saturday day pass, you show up Saturday morning and you go to Saturday night. No, we decided a day is a party to a party. So that if you showed up on Friday, if you got a Saturday day pass, you showed up on Friday night and you stayed until after the Saturday party. You bought a Sunday day pass, you'd show up Saturday night for the party and be there for a Sunday night party. Well, guess what? We have an extra day this time around. So make sure you tune in at the end of the interview and find out about our day, plus, day pass plus idea. And you'll get a chance to hear the possibility of a new tagline for this podcast. Meanwhile... I'm very happy to say that our interview is with someone that I have admired for quite a while and uh, gotten to see at a few different crews and a few different conventions, and I've admired her photography and her bondage, and I even got to compliment her on a picture that was just so fucking hot. Uh -huh. And it wasn't even awkward. Um, so I'm really glad that uh, you get to hear a fun, fun interview with Honey Bear. Now, the interview lasts about an hour. But just so you know, we who were uh, talking there at the, the GRU, we ended up talking for a good hour on past this time because 
Uh, there were just so many interesting topics and subjects that were brought up, both from the interview and from just the uh, different things that happened at the GRU. So I do hope that you will enjoy the interview. If you have any questions, you can always email me, graydancer at gmail.com. Yeah, that's right. I'm back at Gmail. There's reasons. I can talk about them later on. Um, or you can find me on Twitter, graydancer, G-R-A-Y-D-A-N-C-E-R, and the same thing on FetLife. And without any further ado, here is the hour-long interview with Honey Bear. And don't forget to listen at the end of the podcast, because there's some really cool stuff going to be announced about Ropecraft. We are coming to you from the, um, I almost said the afterbirth, <laughs> the after, after, after afterbirth of the, the sixth Pittsburgh crew, uh, which is the 69th crew ever. And one of the cool things about this crew is that Honey Bear's here. And um, Honey Bear has been, uh, I've been a fan of hers for a long time. Do you mind if I use her? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I was thinking about how to start out this podcast, and I, I come from a dance background, right? And it used to be that in, in dance there were these people called triple threats. Okay. Because they could sing, and they could dance, and they could act. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a triple threat in a thing, you're like, oh, damn, I'm a good singer, but I'm not, I can't do it all, so they're not going to hire me. Right. And I was, I was thinking, because I think you'd have to be called a, like a sextuple threat, <laughs> because you, you are a rigger, you are a... Uh, uh, model, uh, uh, you do bottoming, you are a teacher, you are an assistant teacher, you are a, a demo bottom, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, you take photos and you, you know, you, you, you do all these things. Yeah. Self suspension. So, self -sus oh, yeah, missed that. So, sep septuple, <laughs> okay. So, there we go. So, the question is, um, how, would you, how would you describe yourself? If somebody said, hey, so what do you do in kink? What would you say? What's your elevator pitch? Wow. Um, <laughs> I should add, we are also smoking cigars while we're out here. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't even have a role like on my FetLife profile because I, at a certain point, felt like there was no one role that could encompass like all of the things that I sort of am simultaneously and also um, like move back and forth between. So, you know, in a given day, I could be a submissive, or I could be a dominant, or I could be a top, or I could be a sadist, or I could be a masochist, or I could be, you know, so I don't, you know, in terms of what I am in kink, mm -hmm. um, or who I am in kink, I mean, I'd say... Jane of all trades, Jack oh, of all okay. trades. All right. um, you know, I think uh, my kinks tend to revolve around control, um, okay, power that's, and that's control. A, that's interesting. Um, and on, on both sides of the slash, on so both sides of the slash, and I'm also a sadomasochist and have been pretty much my entire life. It was not something I was a varsity rower in high school, so. Oh. Um, okay. So that was like my acceptable outlet for yeah. Yeah, um, masochism. That's, that's okay, so I wish I hadn't said that because my my middle daughter was also a oh uh, yeah in, in um. college. I'm like, I didn't. <laughs> okay, never mind. Yeah, uh, but um, different podcast. <laughs> but yeah, so you know the rope kind of comes in. I describe to people rope is the combination of the power and control aspects and the sadomasochistic aspects. And it's one of the only tools I found in kink where I can accomplish both of those things at once. Um, I really enjoy, like, um, you know, like the restraint and the bondage in terms of the, like, power and mm -hmm. control and the power exchange. And then also it's, you know, it can be very painful. You know, I hear that there are other people who do bondage that isn't painful, but <laughs> yeah. so I, I do not include myself in that, uh, in that group. Um, so let, let's modify one of Midori's uh, questions that, that she recommends for negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm, if I'm watching you do a rope scene, I actually did watch you do some rope last night, mm -hmm. how will I know that you are enjoying, you're having a good time? What, what, are, what are the things that you, that you do in rope or that you do in a scene that you're like, yeah, this is what I wanted, all right? <laughs> um, so... You don't have to do that voice if you don't want to. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so in a, in a sort of like a top space or in a, like a sadistic um, space, obviously it's going to look really different um, than the like submissive or bottomy kind of part of me. Um, and, you know, I think that's a hard question, Gray. How can you, can you tell? I mean, sometimes I like grin stupidly when I'm tying and hurting people. I mean, there's this great photograph on my profile that was taken, like, I want to say it was last summer, the summer before, and I'm like hanging off of my bottom's leg and just like smiling mm-hmm. like this huge, you know, sadistic smile. So, well, okay, so let's modify it a little bit. Yeah. I, and, I, and maybe, maybe, wait, I don't know if you share this or not, but. Like when I am in playing with someone, there are sometimes reactions that I get mm-hmm. that really like extra feed me. Like a mutual mm-hmm. friend of ours recently during a caning scene, mm-hmm. like at one point just whirled me, like, "You fucker!" And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> that's what I that's what I really want to yeah. have. I'm gonna have him swear at me." Uh-huh. Um, so, what uh, is there any particular reaction that you really like? Yeah, that's. that's I mean, I'm for. definitely a reaction junkie. Mm-hmm. So, um, one of the things that I learned very quickly in bondage is that I get frustrated very quickly tying people who are stoic, (laughs) Um, which, you know, unfortunately, as a, a, you know, feminine presenting person who ties, I would get, you know, you know, masculine presenting people to ask the bottom for me. Not stoicness. Right. And then they would get in my rope and just be stone faced. And it's such a buzzkill to me. Like, I get that there are there are doms and tops who enjoy that, like sort of it's service or it's, you know, the control that they have over the bottom that they are able to remain completely silent while being whipped bloody or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But for me, it's really I really want the reaction. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, people like in my rope family who can basically just take anything in rope um, I will bite them or I will do something <laughs> you find that one weakness right yeah. so like um, Ebby Bex for example is one of one oh, of the bottoms a secret here? <laughs> that I've tied most frequently and she's you know fantastic in terms of pain processing and can pretty much take whatever I can dish out rope wise but biting is one of those things that she has trouble processing so that's way more fun for me <laughs> now now, last yeah, night, I did a... ask if I could bite her, and she said no. Aww. She said very lightly, and I was like, well, then I'm not going to bite does, you. Does, does she have a podcast? Who? <laughs> Abby, Abby Bex? No, I don't no? think so. Okay, I'm someone else. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I really enjoy the reaction and the feedback and that mm-hmm. kind of back and forth um, with my bottom. So the more that I'm getting that, the happier I am, you know, in terms of topping. And I also, you know, when I teach bottoming classes and when I'm bottoming, you know, I talk about kind of active bottoming and how to um, kind of create that energy exchange so it's not just this like the top is doing the thing and yeah. you're just kind of there. It, it is kind of funny how it's like the, the, the advice for rope bottoms in the scene so for so long was similar to the advice for men in blowjob classes, which is just lay back and enjoy it because you feel lucky to feel lucky to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, both, I think, are ridiculous. Right. You know, I always need to say. Um, and and I, that, that makes me curious about because, you know, you teach, like, again, quadruple whatever threat you know you teach topping classes you teach bottoming classes i'm guessing you teach switching classes if you need to yeah i can so so how did your rope journey begin though i mean you 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 can't have switched for your very first scene (laughs) unless you were doing self self suspension which side note yeah does it seem like to you that people just assume that if you're doing self suspension you are bottoming to yourself or that, that you are that you are topping yourself and I'm, I've always been confused by that because it seems mm-hmm. to me you could just equally as much say you know, you're topping. Or there, you're bo- there's that saying of you know who did, wait didn't you have a class that was I had who a needs class. a bottom? Who needs a rope top? Who needs a rope top? And I remember yeah. when I saw it, I'm like, yeah, well, who needs a rope bottom? I'll just been myself. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I started purely as like bottom submissive. Um, 
the first person that I ever like was tied by or suspended by is a, a guy by goes by the name Jake Wang from Austin. Oh yeah, I know Jake. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so he was like coming to DC on business every week, and we met at like DC TNG or something like that. And um, so he was like the first person to ever put rope on me. Cool. And then just matter shout of shout out to Jake. I know he listens to the podcast. Yeah, so. Shout out, hi Jake. Um, so, and then I just kind of stumbled and fell um, into the Croc and Slayer with Was Moko and Bimo. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. So Moko was the first person that I ever did like a rope scene with, which is r- kind of ridiculous now. And I think about like four years later and like how how well known he is yeah. and like how and I'm just like, you know, I just happened. That was the first person to ever, you know, tie me for a scene, which is a little bit crazy. And then two months later, I met Lizard and started oh, tying wow. with Lizard and she and I tied together pretty much weekly for the last three years. Now, tied, when you say tied together, you mean she, she tied, tied me. You. Okay. Um, so this was like back in 2013, 20, so beginning of 2014 was when I met Lizard. And I was living long distance from my daddy at the time and just really loved rope. I really wanted to be in rope more and just didn't have enough opportunities. Um, at that point, it wasn't quite as popular as it is now, and there just weren't very many tops in the scene. So I kept a few hanks of Moko Jute in my apartment, and I started just tying myself up, um, mm-hmm. you know, like in front of the TV at the end of the day, whatever, you know, I'm feeling sad, tie myself up, like feeling happy, tie myself up. <laughs> um, and so you did that. Smoke two joints. Yeah. Song there, something like that. <laughs> um, and after about six months or so of doing that, just sort mm-hmm. of for fun, lazily, um, I just, I tried just, it was actually my birthday party. Oh, cool. Um, and I was like, hey, I'm, I think I'm going to try and suspend myself. You know, I think I could do it. Um, and so that was like my first self-suspension and um, started doing a little bit more of that, started going to more classes and taking, you know, lessons here or there. Um, and then people started to ask me to tie them and... You know, like I said, at that time, I was like, oh, no, I'm like only a submissive, you know, like all Mm -hmm. I am is a submissive. Um, So it was a very reluctant top at first. And it was just (laughs) kind of a thing that I did because, like I said, there weren't that many riggers in our community. People liked being tied up and I seemed to be competent enough that they, (laughs) they, Uh, you know, that That would be a very big understatement. Yeah. Yeah. so, uh, you know, it just kind of grew from there. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> so we're at the Grew. Yeah, yeah. Grew. Yeah, okay. um, well, so if I could uh, sort of do a, a parallel track of what you were just talking about. So mm-hmm. talking about rope. And um, if, it's not, if, it, if it is not too personal a question, because you can certainly say, shut the fuck up, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> um, but you also said that you're, you were, your fetish is control. Mm-hmm. And you've used words like submissive. Mm-hmm. So... Did you have, like, a, a parallel track of, like, DS-type relationships and things like that uh, in terms of how that role went? I mean, did you and Lizard have that kind of thing, or was it... Was, did your role... I, I guess I'm asking, did did those two... I know I know that you enjoy DS relationships. Mm-hmm. Right? We talked about that. We don't have to go into it now if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. But I'm interested if your rope track developed parallel to those mm-hmm. or if it was something that was completely separate and disconnected from that's a i mean it was pretty it was pretty separate mm. um so i was like with my in my relationship with my daddy and after about a year and a half we were together he collared me um and i had like a couple of other sort of dominant partners i think we talked last night like i had a professor at one mm-hmm. point um but was just always in the like s type role and when I started topping, I didn't even really feel like identified as a sadist. Mm-hmm. Like it was just sort of, it was the, 
it was the the flow, the feeling of being competent at something that I really liked yeah. about tying. And like I said, you know, people kind of wanting me to do it, and it was like a way to meet people and a way to like engage. So popular, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and there, as a whole I, lot of high school geeks that had that happen, <laughs> and chaos yeah. ensued. But yeah. So, um, so it's definitely it was definitely very separate. And my relationship with my daddy, like he was just never very in, interested in rope, or he just didn't you know really get into that so that was not something that I really explored with him um and Lizard and I never have had like a formal DS dynamic I mean we certainly have power exchange when we play um because her whole thing is like mind fuckery and getting in my head and um so you know that is absolutely a thing um don't don't tell don't tell her this because it would embarrass her but if uh there's a short list of people that I would never be willing to bottom to simply because they scare the fuck out of me when I watch them top. Midori is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, another one is Scott Smith. Mm-hmm. And Lizard is another one. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I love watching the scenes, but I'm like, wow, that yeah. that's fucked up. She, uh, she once tied a scarf, like she tied my hands to my face um, over top of a scarf. Um, and then we did an entire suspension scene and like drool and spit and tears it was eventually like I was waterboarded with my own (laughs) bodily fluids so I mean she's like the only person in the world that I trust to that extent Um, but yeah there so you know again even in that relationship it was very much I was you know if there was DS I was the S Um, but you know, and I for a while kind of was like, I'm not a sadist. Like, I just this is just fun. You know, whatever. <laughs> like, and I would kind of. I'm not a sadist. I just hurt a lot. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of would make light of it. And I mean, anybody who could like watch me tie, like I learned to tie from Lizard and Moko and Bimo. So I was like, yeah. jumping on people. That's and, a gentle rope. <laughs> yes, that's sensual. Yeah, you know, yeah, oh, yeah. The connective rope. Well, it's, it's connected. Definitely <laughs> yeah. connective. Connect um, the fuck out of you. Yeah, connective. <laughs> fuck out of you so um it was it was probably a year after i started tying um maybe not a full year but when i started like regularly tying with bex was really you know we developed a um a pretty good partnership and that was the first time with somebody that i was really able to explore Mm -hmm. the like more sadistic and more like d type side um, and she really kind of allowed me, she and her, you know, her owner allowed me latitude to really like, you know, explore that in a safe way and in a, in a safe relationship and a safe friendship. Um, and, you know, I was able to really experiment with that. And then, you know, I had a couple of um, short relationships. I had a short relationship with a woman so maybe three or four months where I really kind of like let my sadist dominant side out with her and felt really vulnerable. I mean, I know we were talking earlier about how I definitely feel more vulnerable as uh-huh. the S type, but, um, and then so can it, we, can we unpack the, the feeling vulnerable as a dominant? You can yeah. Do, you can do it. Cause I, I think that's, um, I latched onto that from reading Brene Brown's definition of intimacy, which Mm -hmm. is mutual vulnerability. Mm. And that was when I realized that for most of my dominant stuff, I was never being vulnerable. Right. And I'm still working. I mean, I, I... by no means did that, you know, they go, oh, now I'll, now I'll just be vulnerable. That fixes everything. So working at trying to figure out how do you, how do you be vulnerable as a dominant, uh, both in a way that makes you feel comfortable and gets you over the honestly realistic fear that your bottom or your submissive is going to look at you and be like, oh my God, you're weak. Right. Yeah. Um, or like somehow less dominant. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on that? So, I mean, I think that definitely the vulnerability is different. I feel it less. Oh, what way? Um, well, as a bottom, it's very vulnerable in the sense that the other person has control over what's going to happen, right? Or what they're doing. Um, and, you know, if you have a safe word and you've negotiated okay. and all of that, there's obviously, like, ways that the submissive or the S-type has control as well in the situation. Um, but generally, the person having things done to them um, or like being exposed or especially like with Lizard playing with like the psychological mental aspects of things um, 
you know, that's like really get it gets into your head. I think for me, what I mean, like feeling vulnerable as a sadist, as a top was as I started to play um, harder, I guess, as mm-hmm. a sadist. And like, I remember um, negotiating with with Bex and her owner um, a scene. Essentially, that was like, I'm I want to break you. Right. Because she doesn't really like cry a lot in robe. You know, she's just she's very, very flexible and very strong. Victor Drago. uh, So, yeah. Sorry. (laughs) Rocky Four reference for those of you who are. Um, (laughs) I would break break you. (laughs) So, yeah. So there was and and in doing that, it was kind of. You know, you're accessing these very, like, dark parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the vulnerability comes in the, like, realization. You know, whether it's, like, you're vulnerable in that moment, like, I couldn't say necessarily. But the the vulnerability of, of like, right, like, wow, I really did, you know. And, like, holding her after the scene and being, like... You know, am I still the person that can put this back together now that I have broken it? And I think for me, that was really kind of like it coming full circle and me understanding um, how I could be like feel exposed and feel vulnerable and feel, you know, really um, just kind of, you know, that same way from the top or the sadist side. so, So here's. What you're, what you're making me think of is um, the, the other side of that, the am I still the person to be able to put this back together? That's mm-hmm. definitely one worry. Uh, will this person still like me mm-hmm. is another one. And to some extent, there's the, uh, maybe this happens more beforehand, but if I go here, am I going to be able to come back? Mm, mm-hmm. You know, is this is this going to, you know, am I going to turn into this person who really gets off on this shit and right. has to do it more and what will I do? Yeah. And all three of those things are basically taking a risk with your core identity, your sense mm-hmm. of self. Yeah. So, and trying, you know, that yeah. soul, that, that whole parsing between like, you know, I can do like really fucked up, horrible things mm-hmm. and still be a good right. person, you know? And, and it would be so easy to just go through the motions of the things you know are safe. You know, mm-hmm. that, that, you know, it's, you've read this, what does he call it in, in uh, Barrack, calls it the spanky floggy uh, scene, you mm-hmm. know? And, and in those things, you're not really threatening, your, or you're not risking anything. Right. And so I guess maybe the vulnerability is, is going far enough that you are risking your own core identity. Mm hmm. Huh. Yeah. So that's you know, and then I had so like you're gonna have me thinking about this all the way home. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting because when we talk about vulnerability, it's very easy to see how the bottom or the S type might be vulnerable. But um, you know, and then I was like in this, like I was saying, this three or four month relationship with this woman, and I was very vulnerable in terms of like the amount that I was willing to give, like as a top, as a sadist. Um, And then it kind of, like, came about, like, we were kind of talking about this last night, that she was, like, not really that interested in me. Mm -hmm. She seemed more straight than really maybe she led me to believe. And um, eventually I just kind of ended it. And I actually stopped topping for quite a while. It was, like, almost a year. Um, I just put the rope down. and Didn't want to risk having that happen again? Yeah, I mean, I think... For me, too, there's a lot of, and we talked about this a little bit last night, but there's a lot of feeling being this, like, queer, feminine rope top of people are um, pretending to date me or have an interest in me as a person in order to be tied up or have, you know, access to me the rigor, and that was a, a relationship that ultimately felt that way, that it was, you know, and whether or not that was her experience, like, I'm not going to try and... Um, it's what it felt like to you. So right. Yeah, that um, so, you know, I, that was really hard for me. Um, I did eventually, um, you know, pick the rope back up again. Yeah. It, maybe it wasn't a year. It was probably six months later. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also had, like, a short... Um, DS relationship with another woman um, that was much more structured in terms of like we had protocol, we had daily sort of tasks, I mean, those I'm kinds of things. I'm going to ask you to describe that too after you finish the story. Um, 
Hey, you, and you're she saying was, all the right words to me. Right. <laughs> and she was, um, you know, somebody that I was willing to, like, open up and be vulnerable with. Um, and that, you know, ended actually in very mutual good terms. We're still very good friends. It was just a matter of I was polysaturated and I uh. really couldn't give her what she deserved as a submissive while I was also trying to grow, um, you know, with my dominant partners. So, you know, that was like a whole other thing. But, um, yeah, I certainly, you know, I have certainly struggled with, you know, being a switch and like, what does that mean? And how do I, you know, like, how do I fit? And, you know, I, I really think for me, it totally depends upon the person and the connection. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Maybe it's lighter or not, but let's uh, take a little. Bit, let's talk about protocols and stuff like that. Like, what what kind of things do you like to do when you are? Let, let, you work on both sides of this. Yes, so, I do. So let's say, what are what are some uh, services or protocols that feed your um, your uh, service receiver side? Service receiver side. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. Um, but, but for me, about it. but I fantasized right, about so it. Your fantasy is here. Um, so it's generally um, just kind of a like I am a I'm an adult, but I don't I'm not very good at the adulting thing. I really Adulting's like hard. Yeah, yeah. It sucks. Um, so I like people who want to make my life easier um, and who through service. It's not, you know, I, I think of service uh, from both sides of it, right? We shouldn't be adding things that actually create more work for everyone. We mm-hmm. want to be, um, you know, creating rituals or creating service that, um, that benefits everybody. Right. And, um, if it's not improving your life, then what's the point? Right. Um, so it's definitely not something that I've had a lot of experience with, but definitely, you know, just bringing me things, being available for for tasks. Let's, let's, let's just reframe the question. Yes. Can you think of one thing that, like in the last 48 hours... You have to do. You had to do it, mm-hmm. and you just thought to yourself, "God damn, it'd be so much better if somebody's doing this for me." Um, like packing. Packing to that come here. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's something that I used to do for my D type. Right. Um, that's something that Naya does for me. Actually. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, that's I, I. I come at service from a very pragmatic standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, the class, the DS class that I've taught, I mean, maybe I've taught it a handful of times at this point, um, is. Uh, specifically protocol, ritual, reward, and punishment. And um, it kind of talks about how to incorporate different protocol and service Mm -hmm. into daily life so that it is just kind of part of your lifestyle. Now, if you do that, though, doesn't that run the risk of it suddenly not being special? I mean... How do you you avoid that? How do you avoid... Tell tell us the answers. (laughs) (laughs) How do you avoid it not being special? I don't know. I mean, it... It's still so like one of the one of the most servicey things that I did um, for both of my D types was laundry. <laughs> I'm because, sorry, I, I'm, <laughs> la- I'm laughing because uh, part of this whole group trip was um, a, an experience with one person doing service laundry for me, mm-hmm. and then that turning into a group class at the following group. And okay. both of the people who did that are sitting at this table. Service laundry. <laughs> yeah, service okay. laundry. Okay. Yeah. So, so neither one of they hated like folding clothes. Both of them, and so that was my. That was something that I did. It made their life easier, and <laughs> honestly, I would do it. Um, like sometimes I would kneel as I did it. Sometimes mm-hmm. you know I would just sit at their feet, like we were watching TV, and right. so it was like, yes, this is a part of our daily life, but. There was still deep meaning in it. One of the fun things that, that worked out with Naya is that Naya is also uh, very much into the the Marie Kondo life changing magic of tidying up kind of okay. organization stuff. Mm-hmm. So when she read that book, suddenly the laundry doing the laundry was not just a service, but it was also she got to pull the, the t shirts into the little rectangle and get them all lined up and things like that. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's great. Um, related to that, one of the best services that I had have had is. Um, related right to productivity because if you read a lot of productivity manuals they will say one of the key things you can do is you lay out your clothes at night Mm -hmm. you put out your clothes at night so when you get up in the morning you don't have to waste decision time 
figuring out what you're going to wear. Mm-hmm. And for some people, that's you have everything the same, so you don't have to decide. For other people, it's just take the time to lay it out. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hey, I have a serva. I can mm-hmm. I can have this done. So she lays out my clothes at night. Mm-hmm. And the other side benefit of that is she gets to play dress up the dom, hmm. so yeah. she gets to choose what I'm what I'm going to be wearing, and right. I, of course have the right to, to not do it. Yeah. Um, but the the weird sidetrack to this was that when I've been on this trip by myself, I found that I like there was one place I stayed and I like laid out I, I had separate clothes hangers and had all of my outfits for every day <laughs> set up all in a row. Yeah. And I'm as I'm doing it, I'm like, who the fuck am I? What where did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think that, um, y- you know, I, that whole thing about, like, is it going to be less special if you do it? You know, I, I I feel like it gets more special, you know, because it's this huh. this thing that, you know, maybe in a regular non-lifestyle relationship, it would just sort of take for granted, right? Like, I have to, like, do this to, like, be an adult human. Like, I just have to do laundry and I have to fold laundry. Um, but Is, is to, part of it the idea of it, of it making, releasing you to uh, be able to do other things? A little bit, you know, and also just... It's just a way of of showing that I love and care for someone, you know, and, um, Hmm. you know, like this would just be a a thing where, you know, my dominant, um, if he had to like go into the the lab or something and I was like left at his apartment, um, if he like left early, sometimes I would just like tidy things up. Mm -hmm. Right. So then when he would come home to like a nice clean apartment. Now, does that fall into the whole anticipatory service thing? Yeah, I would say so, because that was never anything that he would, like, explicitly tell me to do or ask of me. But it was definitely, you know, I think most people benefit from right. being in a in a tidy environment. So, so let's flip the script here. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the question is, and again, you can feel free to not answer this, because who knows who's going to listen to this podcast, and they may be going like, what? But <laughs> what is something that you've had to do as a service mm-hmm. that you're kind of like, I wish this was not, I, I wish I wasn't so dedicated to being good at service, because I don't want to be doing this. That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, you could <laughs> say that the laundry, again, I mean, there were plenty of times where I did it and I didn't want to be doing it. Um, it wasn't always constantly an orgasmic experience? Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> it's just like multiple yeah. orgasms as I'm sitting there folding socks. And you have to dry the laundry off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I think my, my daddy, for example, um, really, really liked to be cooked for um and to have meals like when he would come home and that is not something that I really do very well um uh, and have never you know so I I I would and I made attempts to um but that would be an example I guess of of things that I did you know in good faith because I was trying to give him what he asked for or what I could tell that he would like, but not necessarily something that I was necessarily like enjoying or, um, but I kind of feel like that kind of service is more important and more valuable to me. I feel like we can, can talk all day about the like sexy ways to serve somebody, but I have felt more owned and more dedicated and more submissive doing the things that are kind of dull like laundry but doing them well but doing them well and okay. doing and and having my d type be you know a notice and appreciate um the things that i that i am doing so mm-hmm. you know i think that and that's something that i talk about like when i do teach ds is that you know we we want to we want to be able to foster a lifestyle that's sustainable number one mm-hmm. you know because I think a lot of people kind of jump into DS they want to have all of the protocols you just make a contract you go to the red room and everything's fine right and they want to do everything at once and then suddenly um, so one of the examples I talk about in my DS class is that when I first was a submissive I thought that like coffee service right everybody does coffee service and they like bring coffee to their D type and then whatever in the morning and so I was like, he, he really liked coffee. He drank it every morning. 
Um, so I was like, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to be this great submissive and do coffee service and bring him coffee in bed. But I am not a morning person. <laughs> yeah. um, far less of a morning person even than he is. Oh, so boy. after a few weeks of like really struggling to do this and then like not doing it half the time and then it's like, OK, well, you can punish me to the ends of the earth. But like I'm really <laughs> never going to be up. able to wake <laughs> up, you know. So, chronotype, yeah. you know, I think that there is a lot to be said for understanding each person's mm -hmm. strengths and not giving them service or giving them tasks that are mm. not playing to those strengths. Right. You know, like if all if your goal is to just make somebody feel incompetent, you can do that. <laughs> like if that's your kink. But uh, yeah, nothing wrong. Nothing, there's anything wrong with that. As long as it's consensual, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, um, you know, I think in terms of like if you if you are trying to build sustainable DS, like lifestyle DS, um, you know, you, you want to make some consideration and not just kind of jump into like like the coffee service thing was just like, well, I've like heard yeah, right. about it yeah. everywhere, you know. So that was like, well, if I was if I really loved him or if I was truly submissive oh, or whatever <laughs> that's that's woo. Woo. Hey. Um, then you know I would be my slave heart would get me out of bed <laughs> in the morning <laughs> you know the words. Yeah. Um, and you know I just at the end of the day that's not yeah. you know that's it, not realistic I, I want to be clear I am not mocking the idea of slave heart at all I think slave hearts are absolutely wonderful I am mocking the idea that someone with a slave heart would have have to do it that way. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah, I don't. I don't want people to think that I am like laughing at the idea of that. No, I mean I yeah. certainly identify with that. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of like when I'm in a owner property or total power exchange. Yeah, like the mm -hmm. slave heart is something that I absolutely identify with. But you know, the idea that because I am a submissive or a slave. Um, that I can just magically call on that any time that I need to like yeah. do something or endure something. That, By like, the power of slave heart. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there has, there's yeah. been a lot of service in, in my experience um, that felt really fulfilling. There's been plenty of service that just didn't work mm -hmm. and we had to, you know, either throw it out altogether or try to do something different. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think um, I don't think that's bad. Like, I really mm -hmm. I, I like to hear about how people um, grow and change and uh, modify their dynamics to fit kind of where they are right, currently right. and not just like, well, this is how it is. And yeah. no matter who the S type or the D type is, we're going to do all of the same whatever, because that's what real DS looks yeah, like. Yeah, that, that's what it said in the Leatherman's handbook. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the Europeans do it. Yeah, the way the Europeans do it, exactly, from the old houses. Um, so I'm gonna, we have an, a studio audience here mm -hmm. that has been listening, and so rather than me dominate all the questions, any questions from the audience that they'd like to ask Honeybear, including the audience outside the tent? Yes. Anyone? Anyone? We're not here. Okay. <laughs> How much wood would a true slave suck if a true slave could suck wood? <laughs> Can true slaves not suck wood? All the slug, all the all the all the wood her top told her to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> slave heart. Yeah. <laughs> That's the answer. Slave heart. Yeah. And, and actually, he he came up with a he he came up with a, a slave liver. A slave liver. Oh yeah. You know, slave prostate. Slave, yeah. You know. Who's slave prostate? That's all. There you go. Slave butthole. Yeah. I have one of those. Those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well then, uh, yes. Is your actual question? No. Give me a minute. Okay. Um, so uh, we've, we've talked about rope and we've talked about uh, power and DS. Let's talk about sex. Yeah. You brought up buttholes. So. Yeah. So um, I did. What What do you think? Even in even in our enlightened kink community and and right. polyamorous heaven that we all live <laughs> right. in. Right. What is, What do you think is one of the things about sexuality that maybe is is misunderstood or that you wish more people could sort of grok it? You know, hmm. figure out what it is. Any, anything in particular that you know, and I'm saying this because, you know, we have an audience here of several thousand listeners mm -hmm. that are going to hear this. You have an opportunity mm -hmm. to yeah. let these people know this one thing that you think that the people should know. Yeah, about. this one thing. So okay. I just popped the question on yeah. you, so now no pressure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess I can, like, 
speak to a little bit of like our conversation last night. I was talking with Gray and a couple of um, friends about, you know, my experience of gender and, and my body and my body dysmorphia, which is, you know, generally related primarily to my genitalia, but um, has always been kind of I, I feel like I'm kind of this person stuck between mm -hmm. um, spaces, like stuck between the feminine and the masculine body. Um, and that, you know, I can lean one way or the other, but I never like really fit, you know, in, mm -hmm. in one or the other. And, you know, I, we were talking last night, there's this fantastic science fiction book um, that I read. Well, there are two books that are based in the same universe, but both by Ursula Le Guin. Mm -hmm. um, and they... Left um, Hand of Darkness and... and the Dispossessed. Dispossessed, yes. and, um And there may be other books in the same universe, but those are the two that I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. And in this universe, um, these individuals kind of are... Uh, without gender in general, um, just kind of they exist as human beings and um, they're all basically the same. And it is only um, when they are like drawn to or attracted kind of chemically or sexually to another individual and they sort of depending upon the energy of that situation take on either the like male or female form in order to mate um, and I remember reading that as a oh, it was 14 something like that um, and just like oh my god I wish I lived in that world right and I wish that I could just depending upon the person that I was that I was with or the connection that I had I could just kind of change my body to you know to mate with perfect. them yeah or just like whatever like shoes you know right. I want hiking boots or I want heels whichever energy I happen to be feeling right. um, and so you know I think uh, like I right now I guess I, I kind of use the term genderqueer but you know, I don't really know like what thing or what word I would use to describe myself. Um, but that's what, what, is, what does queer mean to you? This is something that came up in, in Twitter recently. Yeah, and, and it's not looking for a, an absolute answer. It's just that it, it's I'm interested to know. Like, how so, do you what queer? does gender queer or what is queer? Queer first. Okay, so to me, or maybe gender queer is maybe is that easier? Well, gender queer is kind of like a. A feeling of not belonging on the binary gender spectrum, okay. at least in my kind of that's, understanding. That's a pretty good clear. Um, and queer, just as it's, you know, as a sexuality or as an identity, to me, primarily sexuality-wise. Um, when I first came out, I thought that it was like, okay, you're one or the other, right? So I came out as gay. Then I fell in love with a man, uh, which was really confusing. So then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm bisexual. Then I realized that I was attracted to all sorts of people, pan people, trans people, um, people who, you know, on, not on the binary, didn't really matter what was in their pants. It just mattered who they were. Um, and then at a certain point, I also realized that my primary attraction was to this power exchange element. So to me, queer kind of encompasses a lot of that. It's the it's the not not basing attraction, sexual attraction on somebody's presentation or gender, but it's also the sexuality of being a masochist. Okay. And being, um, you know, a like submissive or a dominant um, who like for me to have fulfilling sex, those things mm -hmm. have to be present. So that is also part of my queerness. Now, I have heard kind of I've heard tell <laughs> of these like, you know, the cis men in the community kind of like, well, I want to identify as queer because as a kinkster, I am oppressed and I believe that I belong in that group or, you know, I don't want to identify as a straight het male. And, you know, I think that that's taking it a little bit too far. Um, okay. Just in the sense that I think being queer implies a level of um, 
I guess, oppression that is experienced by somebody who doesn't operate within the normal parameters of sexuality. And just because you happen to be a kinkster um, doesn't necessarily make you like if you're still like a heteronormative kinkster, you know, I don't know that that appropriating the term queerness is really um, the right way to go. But, you know, there's, like, plenty of arguments on both sides Yeah, it's for not that. an easy question, that's you for know, sure. <laughs> um, for me, it's definitely, it's a combination of my gender and my sexuality, mm-hmm. right? Like, I don't, I don't really identify as bisexual because I don't really think that there are two things that I could be attracted to. Yeah, I, I used to say, you know, I, I'm bisexual, I'm attracted to butch and femme. You know? Right, <laughs> you know, and everything in between, and... Yeah. Um, You know, and sometimes I'm attracted to energy or to, um, to good rope. Yeah. Like to, (laughs) to what was the thing that I heard you say? Like you're, you like people who are like competent. It was maybe not that word. I definitely fetishize competence. Right. Yeah. So especially you combine grace and competence, um, grace, competence and intelligence will really, really do it for me, especially if I can then use part of our sexuality to, uh, turn someone not incompetent but ungraceful and sort mm-hmm. of mind- mindlessly orgasmic right That's one of my turn-ons yeah, yeah. so um yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. so it's definitely you know it's kind of a combination of all of those things it's mm-hmm. the the aspects of you know being sexually attracted to to somebody's brain rather than maybe so are you going to use the body the, the oftentimes ridiculed stream of sapiosexual uh, i mean i had that like for a minute yeah. you know it's like sometimes I, I like it because it does describe i mean yeah you know, it's, it's kind of descriptive a, I, don't, I don't care what else you're like if you don't use your brain to a certain extent or your, your ability maybe critical thinking would be a way to put it mm-hmm. if you don't use your critical thinking right I don't care how much other things are right, right. I'm not going to be attracted to you yeah and um, um, so, I, yeah, I, I definitely you know. fall into that camp you know I've I've heard people describe me as demisexual yeah. because I I don't really I don't really do the casual kind of stuff. I need to have like a really strong mental, emotional, intellectual connection right. with somebody in order to like want to get in their pants. I almost feel I mean I hate to say it because we have so many different words, but sometimes I feel like we need more words <laughs> because like I am heterosexually attracted to female bodies, as in Mm -hmm. I can see a pretty female body, like, wow, that's hot, Mm -hmm. and get sexually excited by it. Mm -hmm. Um, But with males, it's it's what I guess, now I finally understand the term, demisexual, Mm -hmm. where it's not, you know, I look at a man and doesn't hear how good looking he is, I'm like, it doesn't excite me, but in the right situation... A individual male can excite me, mm-hmm. and that, and so yeah. I'm like, well, what's the word for somebody that's not straight, mm-hmm. but at the same time you're not you're you're mm-hmm. demi on one side and your head on the other. Right. And, ah, I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm, so, he, I'm head demi poly by. No, wait, <laughs> fuck. Uh, I heard a really great analogy for that whole thing, um, and it was they they talked about it in terms of like a box of crayons and oh. how like in the 70s or 80s maybe we had like a box of eight crayons, right? So like. I, I blue is my favorite color in mm-hmm. the box of crayons. And then now in the community and the culture that we've created kind of like by way of the internet, but like a lot of other, now we have a box of 64 crayons. So you have cerulean uh, and you have cornflower blue and you have your... all of these. Right. And so now my favorite color is, you know, so I can describe myself as maybe sapiosexual or demisexual where before I was just like, well, I'm gay or I'm straight. Okay. Right. Um, from, from the peanut gallery. Do you, do you mind if I interject for a minute? So I, you, one of the things that I um, kind of have uh, lots of feelings and thoughts about is that it, it, I think one of the issues we run into is when we try to, when we're stuck in a paradigm of spectrum, mm-hmm. like like a spectrum, whether it be, you know, like a spectrum of male to female or a spectrum of, of straight to gay. Um, I, I think it's going to be both limiting and uh, always inaccurate to some degree because really I think it, you get much better descriptions if you break it down into just a bunch of different scales like there's a scale of how sexually attracted I am to male presentation there's a scale of how sexually attracted I am to female presentation there's a different scale for like maybe specific genitalia or mm-hmm. body type or like lots of other things mm-hmm. and you know I think that 
you know, we, we if somebody's like a one on this scale and a ten on this scale, we call that person X, right. and, and we're, we're using sort of shorthand. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like this one instrument as of like to, yeah. trying to describe. You know, I think because we don't want to give somebody really... our, our twenty-seven point sexual, <laughs> yeah. sexual, and and it's it's also part type, of type whatever. It's, it's also part of it is that you know we're like we're, it's like we're doing the um, what was the the geometry book where like a dot falls in love with a line. Oh God, is, I don't know. It's a, but it's basically the <laughs> idea scary. of of you know a dot is one dimensional, a line is two dimensional, right. a square no a square is two dimensional, <laughs> yeah. a line is two dimensional. Anyway, whatever it is, I, I'm not a, I'm a fucking dancer, not a mathematician. <laughs> so anyway, but but it's this idea of um, when you have a spectrum, then you're going to automatically just have one end or the other. Mm-hmm. When the reality may be that it's you know it's not it's not left or right, it's it's quantum and beautiful and strange yeah. and you have time and yeah. um, Midori does an interesting axes I can't remember what they are but it's like she draws a chart and she draws you know up, upward and downward or upward and downward and, and horizontal and you have different quadrants mm-hmm. and then she like draws the Z axis you know mm, through it yeah. three dimensional and you you figure out where you are and she says wherever you end up there you know, you, you call that your fun cloud Nice. And, and like you like it. to hang out in the fun cloud kind yeah. of thing. And every once in a while you find people who your fun clouds interact. And some people your fun clouds aren't even close to each other. Yeah, and who I might... They might look like they're similar from a certain angle because right. of that perspective, the X and the Y. And, you know, out. who I might be attracted to, like, walking down the street... You know, maybe they open their mouth and suddenly I'm not attracted to them anymore. You know, so it's this whole kind of like, okay, like, yeah. So just are we talking just literally a person in a photograph attracted to? Are we talking about like meat space, real life person that I'm interacting with? Yeah. You know, and so it gets really complicated. And so, uh, you know, to be quite honest with you, queer is a, just a really nice umbrella term for yeah, me that I can easy. say, you know, if I like you, I like you. And you don't really need to worry about whatever other stuff there is going on with me. So so going back to the original, the original question, what do you want people to know? Is it basically that there is more to... Sex, sexuality, Horatio, than is dreamt of in your philosophy? Yeah, uh, I mean, pretty our geni- much. Our genitals contain multitudes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, mine, and uh, if I could, if I could switch them, I would, and, uh-huh. you know. Detachable I, penis. Yeah. Detachable penis, you know, I definitely, like, I, I sometimes, like, bristle when I had a conversation with somebody recently, and this was, like, totally not their intention at all, but they were talking about a, a mutual, very good friend of ours who I have had sex with, and... And um, this person is this this man, and he was like, yeah, you know, it's so great. Like, I feel so special because I'm the only dick in this person's life. And I just kind of was like, okay, like, I know what his meaning is. But I kind of want to be like, hey, I have a dick, too. It just (laughs) comes off. You know, and so that's my like sort of way of dealing with those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, it's like even even in our well-meaning, enlightened community, we still kind of grapple with this. Um, you know, we we are products of the culture. Yeah, exactly. We're socialized to be a certain way. Even right. Much try not to. Yeah. So. Um, I guess uh, it's time for the, the lightning round questions. Okay. Much simpler questions as we're, uh, we're getting into the tail end of the podcast here. So um, I'm just double checking. Okay, good. We're still recording. That would have been, would have been a great conversation <laughs> if we stopped recording by accident, but you know. Um, okay, so um, what is uh, uh, your favorite meal? My favorite meal, probably um, chicken tikka masala oh, okay. and garlic naan. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, your beverage of choice? Um... Water, water, sometimes Diet Coke. If I if I asked you to uh, tell me a good movie that I should watch, what would you recommend? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Ooh, yeah, so that's a deep one. That that, that was one that that hurt my brain and yes. and, 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 and my heart. It's so, <laughs> when I watched it. it yeah. You have to be you have to be willing to um, feel the feelings. Yep, yep, that's um, for sure. How about books? I mean, you already recommended two, but let's say let's say I'm like, oh, I've read those. What what is another book you could recommend me? Um, so I'm a really a big fan of dystopian fiction. Oh. So Brave New World is kind yeah, of my really, go-to. You should also you should read Cameron Hurley's uh, God's War trilogy. All right. Oh, yeah. Just, 
<laughs> fucked up dystopian. I mean, yeah. her mirror world true ones are really good. But yeah. yeah. Anyway, oh, I was also going to recommend um, in terms of gender queer science fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anne Leckie uh, has written a trilogy: Ancillary Sword, Ancillary Justice, and I can't what the other ancillary is, but. The main character is completely gender. I, I still don't know what gender that person is. It doesn't yeah. really matter. But, right. But uh, yeah, so that's another recommendation. Um, okay, so um, getting more into kink, um, I uh, I have a magic wand and I can wave this magic wand. It's not that magic. And, hey, <laughs> hey, it's not what they told me. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I'm blushing now. The uh, <laughs> the. Uh, Question. I magic wand, <laughs> and my magic wand has. Yeah, you just. Evan loves the fact that you just totally derailed my question here. <laughs> Sorry, that's all right. I have magic wand. I can wave it, and I can make anyone, real or fictional, alive or dead, appear, and they would want to play with you. So, Jeez. who would you want me to have manifest, and what would you like to do with them? I will say one that's of the not mo- an easier question. No, one of the most interesting ones that I've heard of the answer that was Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> and I was oh. like, "Well, I know a guy who looks like Benjamin Franklin, but I'm not sure if Dove is free." So hmm. Benjamin Franklin would have so much syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> wow! So is this like a this is like to play with, like in a kink? Yeah, whatever. Well, you, know, you can make it sexual if you want, yeah. or sexual. Basically, this this is your this is your fantasy. Anybody at all in the world, you know. I'm trying to think of like characters in books that I've sure. like had hard ons for, um, but I'm definitely struggling to like pick a specific person. Um, so, at the very beginning of my kink exploration, this is like so weird and I don't even know where it's coming from, but it's kind of in the back of my mind. I was with this, uh, this was when I was 19, I was with this guy who was kind of a shithead, but he was like the first person to like beat me up and stuff. <laughs> and, you always remember uh, your face. <laughs> <laughs> and it was right about the time that, like this weird ass movie came out with Jim Carrey and I don't even remember the name of the movie. But he has all of these, like, back tattoos all over him. And he's, like, really, um, like, muscular or whatever. And there's this sex scene where they're playing. Yeah. Wow. They're playing um, She Wants Revenge, Tear You Apart. And it's, like, this sex scene. And I have fantasized about that so many times. So it would be whoever that character was. Um, probably just like very violent sex. Okay, wow, that that is actually really remarkably. Now I want to go find the movie. Yeah, I don't even know. I, I never thought of Jim Carrey as muscular and tattooed, but you know that would work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> so what? <random. laughs> what is something that um, uh, that people would be surprised to hear is in your toy bag? I don't know. If there's anything surprising, I mean, I have. Um, okay, I, I can rephrase the question. If there's nothing other. Uh huh. So the other the other side of this question is just like, you're about to head out to the club or the party or whatever. Um, Why you're like I'm going to have a good time tonight. Mm-hmm. What do you pack in your bag? Um, well, I primarily like rope. my yeah. my primary implement is rope. So mm-hmm. there's definitely rope. Well, what kind? Moco jute. Moco jute. Moco right. jute. Um, and I say which spec? Oh God! Uh, I, I think, know it's like yeah, it's his fault. He, yeah, uh, he right did. now I think maybe it's the MB twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen okay. spec. That was a good year. Yeah. Um, so that's my <laughs> yeah. yeah, I you know I don't know. I've I've always had just I, yeah. I had like Wicked Dave spec at one point. So you can get all this stuff at mocojute.com and he doesn't even sponsor this podcast, but you should still go. Visit yeah, <laughs> um, it's good stuff. So definitely that. I'm really I'm really into mouths. Um, I am a hugely orally fixated, mm-hmm. um, and so I do a lot. I have like an O gag in my bag. Oh, okay. I was gonna say you'd have a. <laughs> you'd have a um, mouth I have a mouth in my bag. bag. <laughs> so I have a, I've and I have an O gag yeah. in my bag, um, and I do a lot of like fingers and mouths and that kind uh-huh. of stuff. Um, so that's kind of like, and you know, I I do. I do have boots, and I do like to kick and stomp people while I am tying them up. So that might also be something that people nice. don't necessarily expect. Um, and my teeth, also, because <laughs> I did mention biting earlier. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and so the final, the final one uh, is: What is your favorite dirty word? 
Mm. Probably cunt. It's a popular one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really, I like that word so much better than pussy. Because um, pussy mm-hmm. has been so, um, in our culture especially, so tied in with, like, weakness and yeah. whatever. Like, the the demasculization. Or cunt demasculization. has the same weakness in Europe. Because it's used in it's just in Britain, right? You know, but to me, it's like we have these very like um, like cock and dick and you know those like very kind it's of and cunt is like a nice yeah, like that's yeah. what I want to like describe yeah. or I use the word junk because mm. that's just very okay. kind of all encompassing. You know, if I'm like not feeling particularly receptive to what I have between my legs, like I might just talk about it, like my junk, blah blah blah. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Where can people uh, find you next? I mean, they, they're like, oh, my God, I really want to see this person teach. Um, or, or so why, why you read more about your website. Yeah. You so, um, I mean, FetLife.com backslash honey underscore bear as a naked. Um, mm-hmm. I'm on Twitter. Um, honey bear as a naked three. Um, and I think the next I'm teaching an intensive in Austin the first week oh, of cool. May. Um, so There's, I'll be in Texas. Jake Wing's going to be there. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. That makes um, sense. And We're have an Austin grew, by the way. Oh. This is actually something nobody's ever nobody else has heard about really we just uh, set a date uh first weekend in november it's gonna be the austin group awesome <laughs> yeah so um i don't know aside from that kind of like ter- like what a big event or anything i'll be at next um but cool. yeah i mean feel free okay. to find me on on the internet right. well thank you for coming on the podcast yeah, thanks so that. much for having me it was great All right, so uh, thank you very much, Honey Bear, for uh, doing that, and thank you, everybody at the uh, GRU for making it possible, uh, including the people that were in our lovely studio audience, and a huge shout-out to Twisted View um, and Kashmira for making the Pittsburgh GRU such a fantastic event and putting up with me for an entire week, uh, sitting on their couch, eating their food, and, and watching their TV. Um Again, I want to give a shout out to our uh, sponsors, JapaneseBound.com, where you can find some fantastic uh, Japanese videos, uh, very many of them exclusively through this site. They are digital downloads, so you have access to them for as long as you want, wherever you want. And uh, also to Twisted Monk. Twisted Monk, who has been a dear friend for a very long time, longer than I think either of us want to imagine. And... um, he uh, always has uh, uh, probably one of the best and smartest businessmen I know, as well as being ethical and a good example of how to integrate kink into your life in a way that benefits everybody. Uh, and Patreons, patrons, you have been I rock to help me get through this. I hope that you have uh, will continue to. And if there's ever anything I need to do to help keep your support, or hey, even you podcast listeners, you can feel free to email me, greatanswer at gmail.com. Uh, yeah, that's right. I went back to Gmail. There's reasons, but we'll get into that another time. I do got to do a slight second just to let you know one little cool little thing that's coming out of Ropecraft. You know that Ropecraft is coming up at the end of May, and you probably already have your ticket because, hey, you're listening to my podcast, and I know you have tickets. But if you don't or if you have friends that are thinking about, hey, you know, I'd really kind of like to go to IML uh, instead of Ropecraft, well, we, we created a way that you can get a little bit of both. Uh, We're having day passes. Now, our day passes are not your average ordinary day passes. They never were. At the beginning, we said a day for us goes from party to party. So instead of just like getting a day pass for Saturday and only having to show up at Saturday morning through the Saturday night party, no, 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 you get to come to the Friday night party, the day of Saturday, and Saturday night. If you get a Sunday day pass, you go Sunday, you go Saturday night party all the way to the Sunday night party. Well, our day pass, day pass plus has that and a little more. So here's the way it works. Basically, any day pass you get not only goes from party to party, but it also includes Monday. Yes, that's right. You get to come in on Memorial Day. So you could hypothetically get a day pass for Saturday uh, at ropecraft.net. You get yourself a day pass and you say, okay, I'm going to go on Friday night. I'm going to go to the meet and greet, great food. Going to enjoy all the dungeon stuff till 2 a.m. Woo! And then I'm going to go to classes on Saturday. Fantastic stuff. 
And then Saturday night, I'm going to go to the party. But then Sunday morning, I'm going to head into Chicago and I'm going to go to International Mr. Leather and look at the the, the amazing marketplace there and all the hot gay leather men there and things like that and participate. And then I'm going to come back and go to the party. Uh, or then I'm going to come back late, late at night and get in my hotel room so that I'm ready for Monday morning when we have the Ropen Space and then Muntertown opens up and then there's a party Monday night. So you get all that stuff. Now, the only thing you'd miss would be the Sunday classes. And, uh, yeah, any of those Day Plus passes, you can read all about them uh, on the website or uh, at ropecraftchicago.bpt.me. Um, and all of them have um, the initial price of our first ever Ropecraft, $139.99. So you actually get just as much Rope Bondage Convention as you would have gotten if you had gotten the very initial price, because that was a two-day con, and that's exactly what we're offering you with our one-day passes. But they're day plus. So if that all sounds complicated, it sounded complicated to me, but it's really, really a good deal is what it comes down to. So go and get your tickets, ropecraft.net. Now, we had a, a suggestion for the tagline. It almost works. Uh, thanks to Prof. Cedar. He said that uh, maybe a good tagline for Great Answers Podcast is something like, hey, when it's more complicated than black and white, that's when you gotta dance in the gray. So, I kinda like it. What do you think? Let me know. Greatanswergmail.com. Meanwhile, I will talk to you next week.